If you're loving the Bible Brief, will you take just a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify? We're having hundreds of people every week try out the show, and we want you to help even more discover the Bible Brief. Potential listeners depend upon your reviews to learn why they should listen. So will you do us a favor? Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Join the cause to help the world learn the life-changing story and message of the Bible. The people in Moses returned to where God called him out of the burning bush. But now the mountain burns with fire, and God speaks from the billowing smoke. On The Bible Brief. Our lives are populated by words. From the womb, we're hearing words. When we're infants, we're speaking our first milestone word. And as we grow, our maturity is often matched by a growing vocabulary of words. By early adulthood, we're simply inundated with words, so much so that it's easy to drown in them. Words in endless books. Words on endless scrolling screens. Words in our favorite songs. Words from cultural commentators. Words, words, words. By the time we're adults, words become cheap, in a sense. There are so many of them that they begin to lose their value. Since new words are just a scroll away, we can throw away words and forget that we ever read them. This wasn't the case for ancient societies. In contrast to ours, ancient societies valued words in ways that we can only barely relate to. People would memorize whole books worth of words because a collection of words like that was rare indeed. And once they would memorize them, they would meditate on them, mutter them quietly, and stew on them. Each word carried an importance that can't be overestimated. In ancient compositions, no word was out of place, because every word mattered. This is especially the case for ancient Israel, because this nation was given the very words of God. God himself communicated with them, and God commissioned them to read, write, understand, and meditate on all his words that were given by him. But perhaps few words are as important as the words that we will hear today. These words are not cheap words. They are words of unchangeable moral perfection. These words are what the Bible calls the Ten Words, or the Ten Commandments. And these words are the foundation for morality as we know it today. Let's listen to this incredible account beginning in Exodus chapter 19, occurring just a few months after the great exodus from Egypt. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay, so Moses is back at the mountain where he saw the burning bush. God has fulfilled his promise to Moses that he had said back in Exodus 3 verse 12. There God had promised Moses, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Leading the people with the pillars of cloud and fire, God had done what he said. Over the past few months, he had led them through the wilderness to the very mountain where he had initially called Moses. And here at Mount Sinai, God offers to make a covenant with the people of Israel. This will be the third major covenant in the Bible so far, so this is an important offer. 
He said that Moses should tell the people that if they will obey God and keep the covenant, that they will be God's treasured possession among all people, and they will be a kingdom of priests and a holy, set-apart nation. Quite an offer. God will treat them special, as they collectively and individually could be priest kings before him as a special people. But what they would need to do is obey God and keep his covenant. Let's keep reading. So Moses came and called the elders of the people, and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. After Moses delivers this offer to the people of Israel, they enthusiastically agree. In one of the few bright moments for the people in the wilderness so far, they agree to God's offer of this covenant and commit themselves to obedience to his covenant. Even without hearing all the commands that God will give as part of the covenant, the people agree, and God moves to the next phase of this covenant agreement. He announces that he's going to come down on the mountain on the third day in the sight of all the people. And he tells Moses to give the people instructions on how to purify themselves for this monumental event. They are to wash their clothes, refrain from touching the mountain, and refrain from sexual relations. They are to be as pure as possible for God's appearance on the mountain. And then the third day comes. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Imagine this just for a moment. You're in the valley looking up at Mount Sinai, a granite mountain that you'd been looking at for days, seeing Moses go up and down the mountain as he spoke to God. But then on this day, the character of the mountain changes completely. That pillar of fire and pillar of smoke are now unified and cover the whole of the mountain. The earth trembles with thundering as you see flashes of lightning in the midst of the smoke and fire. And then you hear the sound of a trumpet growing louder and louder. If this were any other mountain, on any other day, you'd be running away from it. But on this day, the people were prepared, even if they were fearful. They knew that Yahweh their God was descending upon the mountain. And soon, God speaks those most important and timeless words. Words that begin the content of the covenant that he has offered the people. Words that can't be overestimated in their importance. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. 
You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These Ten Commandments are some of the most important words ever uttered or written. Their value exceeds the rarest volumes of Shakespeare, or the original parchment of the Magna Carta. Their value is only matched by obedience to them, because they represent the wise and timeless commands from God upon which lives, societies, and civilizations have been built. God says, in effect, I am Yahweh, your rescuer from Egypt, and I am the true God. Don't worship false gods. Don't make images or representations of me or anything else to worship. You shall not bow down to something or serve something that is man-made. Don't use my name flippantly or without reverence. Remember the Sabbath day of rest. You and everyone in your society shall rest on the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother for your whole life, and your life will be long in the land of Canaan. Don't murder. Don't have sexual relations outside of your marriage. Don't steal. Don't lie in court or seek to deceive others. Don't desire what's your neighbor's, whether it's his house, his wife, or anything else. These commandments form the basic bedrock of the law that God is giving to the people of Israel as part of his covenant with them. He has rescued his people. He has offered the people a special status as his treasured possession to be priest kings before him. And the people have agreed enthusiastically. But with these ten words, the people begin to understand the gravity of what they have agreed to. It's a privilege to be close to God, but it's also fear-inducing if you're not morally pure and upright. Listen to how they respond to these most important words. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. The people don't actually want to hear God's words. As God speaks, they are afraid and trembling, and they begin to shrink back from the mountain. There's something about God's presence and his words that's unbearably fearful, such that they fear God's speech will kill them if he keeps speaking to them from the mountain. They immediately appeal to Moses to be a go-between for them. Moses will hear God's words, and then Moses will speak to the people. Moses will be the prophet for God, speaking God's words on God's behalf with God's approval. And Moses, having heard God's voice many times now, doesn't fear as the others do. While the people stand far off, Moses approaches the mountain. Join us next time as Moses receives these covenant laws from God before disaster strikes the nation as they forget one of these Ten Commands. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.